Hi, my name is Jennifer and I post book videos every Sunday. My August to September wrap up will be popping up in your feeds on Wednesday. I've said it now, so it'll happen somehow. But today I'm gonna to talk about my reaction to Hot Milk by Deborah Levy. This is the first from the Man Booker shortlist that I chose to read. And I think it actually benefited a lot from the kind of scrutiny that I brought to it as a Man Booker title. We follow 24 year old Sophia and her mother Rose who are British, but are in Spain currently seeking experimental medical treatment because Rose claims she can't feel her legs or feet. Now we learned pretty early on that she's lying or at least not telling the whole truth. Sophia has been taking care of her mother's alphabet soup list of ailments since her father left them when she was a child, and we spend the whole novel in Sophia's head. And what a fun place it is to be. This has strong echoes of Kafka, because like most of his narrators, Sophia walks through the world almost as if she's underwater. It's like she can see everyone else on the shore and she can't fathom how they're living their lives so easily. Each one of her thoughts or feelings comes at a cost, like she's pushing her way through the world, like her world is resisting her. So everything is surreal, and she ends up laser focusing on certain aspects of the world, almost to confirm its reality. And color is one of those things that really anchors her to reality. It's a big deal for her, so get ready to be informed of all the colors of all the random objects that pop up in this novel, especially fruits or flowers, and and lips, eyes, skin, and hair. And this brings me to another Kafka-esque feature of the narration, which is Sophia's crippling self-doubt paired with her rampaging narcissism. Often she attributes a quote to another character that sounds exactly like something she would say. So when she meets her mother's doctor, she keeps remarking on the white and silver of his hair and how blue his eyes are. Like she can't make a comment about one of his facial expressions without reminding us that his eyes are blue. And then the doctor himself starts talking about his clinic and he says, this marble is extracted from the earth of Kobdar. Its color resembles the pale skin of my deceased wife. At another moment, a character looks at Sophia and says, Your lips are splitting from the sun, like the almonds split on the trees of Andalusia when they are ripening. I interpreted these and many other moments as Sophia's own observations that have been twisted in her memory and slipped into other people's mouths. And the fun thing is, you can never be really sure who actually expressed a thought. Another fun thing is that Sophia keeps switching from past tense to present tense and back again, sometimes from chapter to chapter, sometimes from line to line, and not always for a significant reason. So it feels like you're looking through a camera lens that's involuntarily going in and out of focus. And one of my absolute favorite moments comes comes when Sophia acknowledges that she's lost her grip on time. She says, when I note down ideas for field studies, I don't know whether I'm writing in the past or present tense or both of them at the same time, and I still have not freed Pablo's dog. What I loved is that I thought Levy was being too obvious with this line, like she was nudging readers towards noticing the tense shifts, but actually that's not what she was doing at all, because she followed this musing about how you can confuse the past and the present with a line in the present perfect tense. I still have not freed Pablo's dog. People, I'm an English as a foreign language teacher. I almost freaked out at how much I love this. That is the genius of the present perfect tense. And it doesn't exist in Slavic languages. They only have past, present, and future simple tenses. So they don't use verb tenses to convey time subtleties. They have other ways of doing that. But in English, one of the uses of the present perfect is to convey that the past and the present are connected in some way. So consider these phrases from my life. I have studied Russian for several months versus I studied French for one year. The past simple, like in the French example, stresses that things stay in the past, they're finished. But the present perfect allows us to connect time periods and to say this thing was true in the past and it still is true today. And you could have easily skipped over these lines in hot milk. I almost didn't notice what made them special, but then I was almost knocked over by how clever they were. And this book has so many little gems like that that are waiting to be unearthed. Like there's the fact that Sophia keeps forgetting to completely dress herself. So she'll be running down the beach and suddenly realize that her bathing suit top has been hanging off her. Or she'll have the whole back of her dress unzipped and won't notice until someone points it out to her. And yeah, she's spacey. But the significant thing is that she keeps forgetting how much of herself she's leaving bare. She's not in control of what she covers up and what she exposes. She also grapples with 
big life themes in ways that manage to feel dynamic instead of ponderous. One thing she's constantly considering is what roles family members are supposed to play and how will they play them. And if a family is still real and whole, if its members have switched roles or have created roles that aren't in society's script. She also wonders what facts about a person define them. And the funniest example of this is when she's looking at a picture of Donald Duck and she starts reflecting on him. She says, is Donald Duck a child or a hormonal teenager or an immature adult? Or is he all of those things at the same time, like I probably am? Does he ever weep? What effect does rain have on his mood? When does he say no and when does he say yes? She often has these moments where she'll pick questions that are equal parts profound and arbitrary to try to unpack the people in front of her. Okay, as you can probably tell from all the really nice things I've been saying, I really liked this book. Frankly, I was surprised by how much I liked it considering the lukewarm reviews it's been getting all over booktube. But being me, we can't have all positives. I criticize even my favorite books and Hot Milk isn't one of those because I had no emotional attachment to anything that was happening. I think that's a risk that Levy takes with this kind of psychological, a bit over your head narration. And Sophia is supposed to be a narrator who has trouble connecting with herself and connecting with the rest of the world. So it's hard to get your footing as a reader and feel her struggles. Like I never experienced her pain as a deep rooted, weighted, Feeling. And despite all my praise for the writing, I don't see Hot Milk being all that memorable down the line. I can imagine it fading pretty easily because it's all a bit nebulous and it's not quite original enough to be a defining kind of book. But like I've been saying, whether or not it hooked me emotionally, it hooked me intellectually in so many interesting ways. And I just love it as an example of the complexity that can be achieved with simple sentences. Like the fewer convoluted sentences I have to read in my life, the happier I am. And maybe most notably of all, I didn't realize how significant it would be for me to read a Kafkaesque narration from the perspective of a woman. Because that's one of my beefs with Kafka. He can barely think of women as human, let alone as narrators of their own stories or as people who exist to shape their own realities, not just his. Hot Milk showed me how enjoyable this kind of writing can be when it's shared across identities. Don't read it if you're in the mood for a plot-based book. D do not. But it's really short. It's only about 220 pages. And so if the narrative voice that I've been describing sounds remotely interesting to you, just consider picking up a copy of Hot Milk. Bye and thanks for watching.